thanks Paddy and thanks Neil and thanks Jessica. So now we're going to the, the main address of the evening, which is going to be delivered by Dr. Brian McMahon. Um, after taking law degrees at University College Dublin and at Harvard Law School, where he was one of the first Irish students to attend, Dr. McMahon joined the Department of Law in University College Cork, where he became professor and head of the department. He subsequently held a part-time chair of law at this university while practicing as a senior partner with the Houlihan and McMahon Law Firm. A founding member of the Irish Association of Law Teachers, he has authored several legal textbooks and also been chair of the governing body of UCC. Having become a judge of the circuit court in 1999, he was promoted to the High Court in 2007. In 2012, he was made an honorary doctor of laws by UCD. Since retiring from the bench in 2011, Dr. McMahon has extended his record of civic engagement, which includes service as chair of the Irish University's Quality Board, of the National Archives Advisory Council, and of the Abbey Theatre. <laughs> as well as leading advisory groups on crime and the constitutional referendum on judges' pay. Most recently, he led a government-appointed working group to produce the McMahon Report 2015 on improvements to the protection process, including direct provision and supports to asylum seekers. Since that report was submitted, Dr. McMahon has remained actively involved in the public discussion of progress and shortfalls in the state's response to that report's recommendations. So, will you give a big welcome please to Dr. Brian McMahon. I think <laughs> To win uh, the All Ireland for the first time in 29 years, and not only that, to win the Leinster title and the league, and for the minors to win the All Ireland title in the same year, you must be bursting. <laughs> and it's an extraordinary achievement after such a long wait. The, I was at Croke Park in uh, 29 years ago in the company of one of the great. Galway hurlers who never won an All Ireland, Joe Salmon. And on that occasion, he did a jig. <laughs> and since then, he has moved on, but I have no doubt he did several jigs last month <laughs> in, in honor of the occasion. Um, when I was approached by Stephen Ray to give this lecture, Stephen, in his low-key, subtle way, might have been accused of selling me a pup. <laughs> in the sense that he said, uh, you'll say a couple of words at a thing we're having in Galway. Very low-key stuff. Uh, you won't have to do much preparation. It is all right. And uh, of course, uh, I suddenly woke up that I was going to be Field Day's annual Seamus Dean lecture lecturer for the night and uh, of course Ray was not to be seen. It reminds me of the story uh, of Aubrey Waugh, one of the Waugh, the famous literary family in uh, England, who uh, was a well-known lecturer, journalist, writer and he was asleep in his apartment in Park Lane. And in the middle of the night, he got a phone call. And he struggled in the dark, and he pulled his eye mask off. 
uh, and he grabbed the phone and clearly from the voice at the other end, it was an African voice. And it said, you will lecture to our students. And he rubbed the sleep from his eyes and sat up, you will lecture to our students in Lagos University. And he sat up further and what do you want me to speak on? And he said, I would like you to speak on press freedom in Africa. So he made a note of this and went back to sleep. But three days later, an envelope came with a first class ticket for two weeks time to Lagos. So this was serious business, first class. He wasn't used to flying first class. <laughs> so he decided that he better get himself in shape. So he spent the next two weeks writing his lecture. And he spent a lot of the time and detail with it. And the time came for him to depart. He went to Heathrow and he checked his bag four times to see that he didn't leave his lecture. He didn't worry about his passport, but had he his lecture? He got on board and he wasn't used, as I say, to first class travel and he overindulged a little bit in the bubbly, but it didn't matter because there was a day between his landing and the lecture. But when he was some hours out, the air hostess came to him and said, there's been a little error in the timing. You won't have time to go to your hotel. The car will be on the Tarm Academy and you've got to go straight to the university because they're all gathered there when you come. So he rushed and panicked to the washroom, spruced himself up as best he could, felt his lecture bag again, and sure enough, he got great consolation from that. When the plane landed, he was first off, and there was a limousine on the Tarm Academy, and a gentleman, magnificently dressed in African garb, approached him, introduced himself as the president, and ushered him into the limousine, and they drove. In 20 minutes, they were in the university, and this magnificent theater, 500 people all gathered, and a hush fell when he came in. He sat down, the president began to introduce him, and while he was getting his lecture out of his bag, he looked at the blackboard behind him. And there written on the blackboard was the subject of the lecture, breastfeeding in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> and someone said, what did you do? Well, he said, I took my lecture out of my bag, I put it on the podium, and I read it word for word, <laughs> as I had written it, except for the word press freedom, I substituted breastfeeding every time it came. Try it sometime. The moral of the story, of course, is when you're invited to give a lecture, get it in writing. <laughs> so you know what you're in for. That's the last laugh you will have tonight, I might as well tell you. I'd like to start uh, this lecture with a statistic. I, the Minister for Justice invited me to preside over the new ceremonies for new citizens in 2006. And since, uh, sorry, 2011, and since that date, the state has conferred citizenship on 107,000 new citizens. 107,000 in six years. From 180 countries. It's a sobering figure when you look at it, and suddenly in a period of 10 or 15 years we have become multicultural, from a monocultural society to a multicultural society, and Galway, I notice, is the most multicultural city in Ireland, so I'm not telling you anything new. I was asked at a conference le lately by a professor of uh, refugee studies when she heard this figure 
and what do you say to these people? She was interested in the tone of the welcome and what we were saying to these new people when they got their degrees. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I say to them. I say to them, first of all, when the state honors you today by granting you citizenship, it does not require that you forget the country you came from. It does not ask you to erase your memories or your personal and unique history. When you make your declaration of fidelity to the state in a moment, do not forget the country, your own country, your own people, your own traditions. Such memories are not contraband. Bring with you your songs, your music, and your stories. Someday your children or your children's children will ask you about their grandparents and will inquire about the old country. Do not deny them their legacy. It is your duty and your responsibility to remind them of that part of their story that is to be found in another land. Towards the end of the remarks, I conclude by saying, my parents and my grandparents, back to generations, were born in this country. And for the most part, my family has lived in this country for centuries. But after this ceremony, I will have no greater legal rights in this country than you will have. Because under our constitution, under your constitution now, all citizens are equal. The new are equal to the old. There are no second class or half citizens. You are, as well as I am, entitled to the full protection of the Constitution and the personal guarantees contained therein. In view of what I'm going to say later on about the Supreme Court decision, those are important words. And what I try to do in delivering these marks, remarks is to encourage the new citizens to integrate, not to change themselves, but to bring their diversity with them and to enrich our society. We are not afraid of what they have to bring. In fact, we embrace it. We are an island people. We are insular. In fact, it might be suggested, DNA-wise, that we're incestuous. <laughs> so a good dollop of external infusion might not be a bad thing for this country. Maybe it would help our athletes to perform better in the Olympic Games. <laughs> and I tell them that I look forward to the day when one of their children or one of their children's children lead the All Ireland football team onto Croke Park or the All Ireland hurling team into Croke Park. And that's not so far-fetched. Last year, there was a gentleman left half forward for Mayo who had a Pakistani parents. There was a forward came on for Kerry Miners this year in the All Ireland final whose parents were from Nigeria originally. So this is to be welcomed. I I'll tell you a story, a simple story, because the story is everything and everything is a story. I was driving from my home in Kells last November to Dublin on a Sunday morning about half ten. The roads were quiet. As you would expect, 
The weather was dull, heavy, lead, gunmetal gray. Big cumulus bags of water threatening overhead. And I turned the corner as I was going into Navan, and suddenly my spirits lifted. There was a magnificent African woman dressed in an African costume. She was about, well, six foot. She had a wonderful headdress, beautiful dress and a bustle, bright yellow and black slashes on it. She had a little boy in a blue suit on her right hand and a little girl with pigtails and bows on her left and dutifully marching behind her husband in a blue suit as well. And they were heading to the Baptist church outside Navan. And my spirits rose. And it figuratively, it seemed to me that this is what we would get from the diversity of these people. They will brighten our lives. They will bring the sunshine with them, color-wise, attitude-wise, and in every sense that we care for. I fancy, I'm, I'm in, intrigued to some extent by what I've seen in the last two days. I went to John Behan's show last night, and I was struck by his beautiful sculptures, sculptures, many of which were of the famine, and some of which were of the refugees. I hear Jessica with her poem on Mosny. I heard Paddy Glacken playing Glown Nagalt. I grew up not far from Glown Nagalt. It's a place outside Tralee on the way to Dingle, for few of you who don't know it. I wasn't kept there. <laughs> so there's huge resonances in our art form to these things, if you look for it. And to some extent, why shouldn't we welcome these people? We are a nation of immigrants. The president yesterday told us there was over 90,000 Irish-born people in Australia at the moment. There are over 50,000 undocumented hanging around Boston somewhere. And we have been all over the world. Our missionaries have been all over the world. And some of you may say that kind of exercise is intrusive. But my own experience, and I had an aunt who spent 25 years in Nigeria, and I think she did mostly building houses, teaching, and running a hospital. I don't think there was a lot of proselytizing going on directly. And how can we now look at people from these countries who said, yes, your message was very good. We'd like to come to Ireland. Well, welcome. Bring him on, that's what I would say. The, we, we are a country, as I say, of immigrants. We understand dislocation. I'm reminded of that wonderful book by Sean O'Toole and Tom Kinsella, The Dispossessed. And I don't have to say much more referring to our history. We were all dispossessed. This Heller to Connacht, you know, emigrate, the emigration boats. So we don't have to be told about the pain, or we shouldn't have to be told about the pain of people in direct provision or people coming to this country from uh, lesser well-off countries, if I might put it that way. Some people say that the Irish are racist. I'd like to address that. I don't believe it for a minute. If you look at the crime statistics, the Garda statistics, no, I know I'm on tricky ground. <laughs> <laughs> Quoting Garda statistics, but the devil cited scripture for his own purposes. But it's all we have. And do you know how many crime hit incidents there were in, country, in the country in 2016? 198. 
crime incidents, that's hate incidents, race incidents. It would be a bad puck fair that you wouldn't get that on a Monday morning in the district court after 168 uh, crimes. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting that any of these should be trivialized, trivialized. Each of these is a serious matter. But we don't have the hate race thing in this country, in my experience. I have interviewed many of the asylum seekers in the direct provision when we went around doing our research. I asked them pointedly that question. Most of them said they didn't see it. They said there was some bit of it here, there was a bit of it there, some for a shouted on a bus. But by and large, if you look at that uh, series in the Irish Times, uh, new to our parish, and I have no doubt the Irish Times would publish it if it were otherwise, but I don't see any of them ever saying that they were uh, discriminated on the base of race. I have no doubt some of it goes on. I'm not naive. I have had a legal career. I, I'm not naive. But in terms of being bad racist in, in the big sense, I don't think we are. And I don't think we have anything to fear about. The, the same statistics, by the way, said that there were six times more racial incidents, hate incidents, in the north of Ireland than there is in the south. And that's not always against Pakistanis and, and, and uh, Africans. It's probably Protestant against Catholic and Catholic against Protestant. So let's not get exaggerated in these matters. There are ignorant people. There are juvenile people. There are uneducated people who will throw slurs sometimes. But as I say, when the Mayo people go up to uh, Dublin for an all Ireland, there's many of them jeered as being culties and so forth and so on. And that's not about race or about colour. It's, it's something else. And I think that a lot of that is trivial. It's not terribly important in terms of a deep characteristic in the race. Direct provision. Now, I want to contrast what I've just said about the 107,000. These are 107,000 people who came lawfully to this country, took up jobs, worked for five years or more, and then applied for citizenship. They paid their taxes, and they were visible people who were contributing to the economy. Contrast that spirit of generosity with direct provision where we're talking about perhaps 8,000 moving up and down in direct provision. Now, let me define direct provision, because some of you um, lay people might not appreciate what it means, and there's a lot of confusion on it. It's, it's, the direct provision is used in two, two, two senses. First of all, we talk about direct provision as a system of payment. And second of all, we talk about direct provision as the centers buildings where people stay. So if you keep that uh, distinction in your mind, you, some of the confusion will fall away. Let's talk about direct provision as a system. When Ireland, as a member of the Community of Nations, signed uh, conventions in 1951 with regard to asylum and refugees, they undertook to deal with asylum seekers who were fetched up on our shores in a certain way. They were assessed, they were, details were taken, and they were subjected to an application process. Now, a person coming into the country uh, as an asylum seeker might look for three different kinds of status. He or she might say he wants to be uh, classified as a refugee. That's the highest standard you can get because there are a lot of protections going at international law for people who are refugees. And there's a definition of what a refugee is. A person who is in fear of returning home to his own country because of persecution, either racial, cultural, or otherwise. If he or she fails in that, he then can apply for a different category, what we call subsidiary protection. And this is a status that the European Union has adopted. It's 
lower down, and it's more, it's more easier to get into subsidiary protection. If you can't get into it, you still have to get in there. And the third category is if you fail in the first two, you can apply for leave to remain. You apply to the government and say, we'd like to stay. And the government has a certain course of discretion to allow it or not. Now, the problem with our system is that when people 10 years ago came in, and more, 15 years ago, 2000, they applied in this Byzantine fashion system. And they were involved in three separate legal cases successively. They weren't all dealt with together. They were dealt with successively. So you applied for refugee status. If you failed, you could appeal that. That took another year. And after that, if you did, you might challenge it and go to the courts. And if you fail there, you could start again at the next session. Subsidiary protection. And if you refused, appeal it. And if you refused, go to the court. So it was inevitable that the process was going to be long and, and drawn out. Now, one of the uh, improvements that have been recently made is that the government introduced the International Protection Act uh, in 2016, which telescopes all these three hearings into one hearing. And the theory is that it should now take about one third of the time that it used to take in processing these people. The process meant that people had to continually stay in direct provision while the process was ongoing. They couldn't uh, take up work. They couldn't uh, travel. They had no status. So they had to wait. And this meant that some of the people in the direct provision centers were there for seven, eight, ten years, waiting for a result. And for that delay, in my view, our government was responsible and culpable. They made an international convention that they would deal and process people, and implicit in that is that they would deal and process them pro properly and in a timely fashion. And if they don't and didn't, then, in my view, that's a fault. Now, the government was aware of this criticism, and uh, in 2014, uh, they asked me to chair a working group. And a working group was a very interesting body. It had about 34, 35 people uh, a com a composed and comprised of many civil servants, which was a, a new interesting thing. There was mem uh, people from the civil service on the various departments on it. There was in, outstanding individuals, former secretary of the department, outstanding trade unionists, and there was all the NGOs who were represented, the non-government agencies who were interested in refugees as there. So we had about 34 or 35 on the group. We worked quite hard and quite quickly, and by June 2015, we had a report. We made 173 recommendations. And the two important and outstanding recommendation that concerned us was the length of time that people stayed in direct provision. And secondly, that people did not have the right to work. Now, there's a whole lot of other things we were concerned, but those were the two big issues. With regard to the length of time, I don't have to elaborate what damage it will do to people if they are kept in places. Uh, where they have to stay for 10 years. The damage it does to their dignity, to their self-esteem, and to their uh, very, um, what shall I say, personality is huge. And in many cases, in my view, irreversible. The hope was, we, we recommended that the government would bring in the new system, Three, one instead of three, in the hope that if they put in the resources, you would clear, clear the, the, the system quicker and that people would get a decision within 12 months or 18 months at most. Um, we also realized, however, that unless the government invested in this, the new system, 
you would get a backlog again. A second problem that we found was that there was already a backlog in the system. So before you could go to a tabula rasa of a new system, you had to get rid of the backlog of five, four or 5,000 people, many of whom were there for five years or more. So we suggested that the five year plus, what we call the long stairs, should be dealt with quickly and swiftly and given leave to remain so that that would be cleared out of the system and the new system would deal with people as they're, as they're coming in. The government did not accept that provision uh, in principle. They said it was too dangerous, etc. There'd be a pull factor, and so forth and so on. But I will say this into the government, that while they didn't accept it in principle or explicitly, behind the scenes, they did work to reduce the number of five-year people. And that number now has shrunk to about five or 600, I think, at the moment. So uh, the, the government must get credit for that. With regard to the physical centers, the direct provision centers, we have 34 of those in the country. And they're a disparate group of buildings and properties. Some of them are old secondary schools. Some of them, like Mosney, is a former holiday camp. Some of them are institutions, former in residential institutions. So there's a variety of them around the place. And they differ. And they're not all even in the sense that there's, there's not a model one. So that some people will say, I was in a Sloan and it's terrible. I'd like to be in Hatch Hall. Or I was in Hatch Hall and there's a Clondalk and it's terrible. We visited all the direct provision centers when we made our report. And we found, pointed out the flaws and the difficulties and the problems. Um, they represented crowded conditions, number one. Many of the women and husbands and women with children were in one hot, hot, family, a hotel bedroom, living in, in that kind of situation. No specific place for the children to do their homework, you know. Mum told me she had to shout at her son to get out of the toilet so her, her little sister could do his, her homework on the toilet seat. You have lack of privacy. Many of the couples, the women in particular, complained about the lack of privacy. Not that they were exposed to everyone, but they're even with their family. They have teenage sons, teenage daughters, taking a shower, having relationships with their husband and wife. Not easy, stressful. Um, also, a disparate group of different nationalities in these places. And we think, you know, in our innocence, that they're all the same. All these asylum seekers are the same. They're not us, therefore they must be the same. But I questioned a manager who had decided he would try to be helpful, and he put four Nigerians in the one room in a center, and the Nigerians nearly killed each other. And I don't mean that. But they were not aware that some North Nigeria is so different from South Nigeria or East Nigeria and West Nigeria. Very, very different. And to be insensitive to that kind of thing uh, was a complaint that was made to us. There was no cooking facilities. This has got a lot of publicity lately. They couldn't cook a meal. Everything was handed to them. You had to be down at breakfast. You got the breakfast, what it was. Basic. Edible? No doubt. You come in at lunch and you got a basic meal. Edible? I've eaten in many of these places. I've come into these places unannounced and lined up with the residents and had a meal. And I could quite easily eat it. Whether I could eat it day after day, year after year, for eight years, I doubt. So there was, there's a variety of, uh, of centers. The 
conflict of different nationality. We came across a room one time where uh, there was a fellow from Morocco up in a, a double bed, and there was two beds upstairs, and he was up in the, uh, looking at uh, Manchester United versus, you know, someone on a mobile television, and the Muslim was trying to say his prayers in between the beds. So you had that kind of conflict in a confined space. Very, very difficult, to say the least. And all of this monotony was lived in with no end in sight, no certainty, no hope, no knowledge of where and when it was going to end. Kafkaesque is the word I would have used in describing some of that. And many of these people, these residents, were damaged. Their self-esteem esteem was broken. Their self-respect and their dignity was lost. I'm not going to go on uh, any more of that because in a moment after this lecture, I will be talking to Blessing, who has, will give her own testimony of living for seven or eight years in a direct provision center. And it's better and more powerful if her story is told in her own voice. The length of the legal process was not solved immediately by the new system. And that was partly because the backlog came in and it prevented, it prevented uh, the transition smoothly to the new system. I will uh, focus now, if I might, on one particular problem that I personally saw as being very, very acute when we visited the centers, and that was they had not got the right to work. And this with the boredom, the ennui, the monotony meant that these people were dehumanized. You go into a center and you see these young men and they're going around almost hollowed out, is the word I use the expression. The, 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 the sparkle had gone from their eyes. They were dull. They were dehumanized. And I spoke to one man I remember vividly at one of the centers and I said, how are you getting on today? I was referring to his legal position. Where, what stage in the process was he? And he said, Forget about my papers. Forget about my legal team. All I want to do is get up in the morning, put on my clothes, have my breakfast with my wife and children, and go to work. I will work for nothing. And I want to come home in the evening and sit down with my wife and children and say to my children, today I work. Now, that kind of testimony is huge, and it's, it's very common. And when people were driven to that kind of isolation, their self-esteem is gone. They become depressed. They become de-skilled. Any skills there, and many of the people, the asylum, are skilled people, different skills. But after eight years, without using their skills, they're not skilled anymore. And when, if they're fortunate to be in the 15% that wins the raffle, that gets permission to stay in one uh, status or another, they're now not suitable to integrate. Their skills have gone. Their socialization, they're institutionalized. Many of them are on medication. Valium. The women will tell you that in particular. So the combination, therefore, of the length of time that you're to stay here with the right of or the condition of idleness is a powerful cocktail which can dehumanize all of these people. It's shown by international research 
but the benefits of employment are undeniable. For instance, if these people were given, if the residents were given the right to work, let's say, after six months, nine months. We're the only country, by the way, with, uh, with Latvia in Europe who does not give the right to work to asylum seekers after nine months. All the rest of Europe do it. Why we don't do it, I don't know. And contrast what I've opened with. Our generous approach to new citizens who have a bit of paper when they come in, maybe. So if you give the people in direct provision the right to work, we would be harmonized with the other European countries. It has been undeniably recognized that working promotes health and well-being. It facilitates integration when they get the right to stay. They are much better able to integrate because they've had a job, they've been in society, they have been mixing. It promotes self-sufficiency and independence, whereas to deny it promotes dependency and institutionalized thinking. And furthermore, it enhances the dignity of the individual. These are undeniable benefits to the right to work. And our report uh, unequivocally suggested that anyone who has not got a decision, first instance decision, within nine months should be allowed to work immediately. That was not done. The government did not allow that. Interestingly enough then, what happened? The matter was taken to the Supreme Court by one resident, a gentleman from Burma, who decided that he would sue the state and base an argument not on the Immigration Act or the legislation, the local legislation, but on human rights. We heard Paddy Glacken and Napoleon's The Rights of Man. And he decided that he would make an argument to our Supreme Court on a human rights basis. He pleaded the Charter of the European Union. He pleaded the Convention on Human Rights, the Strasbourg Convention. But he also based his argument on the Irish Constitution, Bunroch na And he succeeded. And it's interesting because the title of this is the right to rights. And the Supreme Court, to its credit, held that an asylum seeker in his position had a right to work. That was the bottom line. Uh, it first of all held that they would continue to hear it even though the applicant had got his papers halfway through the case and the case had become moot in the sense that it was no longer an issue for this man. So the courts in many cases in that type of situation will say, well, he has no more complaints, he's got his paper, he can work away, we will st stop hearing it. But they considered in this case that the, there was a, an important point of law of general importance that they would continue to hear it even though his case was resolved. The second thing that the Supreme Court held was that there is a right to work in the Constitution. Now, there was a serious uh, jurisprudence on that, but the jurisprudence uh, uh, that existed was uh, not very well defined or clarified. And so the right to work was trotted out sometimes without any inquisition as to what exactly the right to work meant. But, and the Supreme Court referred to that, that the right of work is a bit vague, but nevertheless there is a right to work in this situation. They also related to the section 41 of the Constitution, the equality section, which says that all citizens shall, as human persons, be held equal before the law. All citizens were held equal. The question then was, Asylum seekers aren't citizens, and how are they going to benefit from this? But the court held that an asylum seeker might benefit from that, even though they are not citizens. 
I'll just quote one bit from the Supreme Court, which is telling. It said, a right to work at least in the sense of freedom to work or seek employment is a part of the human personality. And accordingly, the Article 40.1 requirements that individuals as human persons are required to be held equal before the law means that those aspects of the right which are part of human personality cannot be withheld absolutely from citizens. It goes on and it says, accordingly in principle, Mr. Justice O'Donnell, MacDonald, say it said, I would be prepared to hold that in the circumstances where there is no temporal limit on asylum process and there is an absolute prohibition on seeking employment contained in the Act is contrary to the constitutional right to seek employment. Now that was very strong language and a strong recognition. It, in fact, mirrored what we said in our report, that we felt from a moral point of view, not we didn't argue on constitutional rights or legal rights, we just argued a moral position was that people like this should be allowed to, to, to work. The Supreme Court, however, paid uh, respect to the other sections in the Constitution, the separation of powers section, which says, it's not for us, the Supreme Court, to make the laws on when they write the work, but we're telling you the absolute ban that you have on the right to work is wrong, and you better come up with an alternative. So they sent the government away, and the government is due to come back to the Supreme Court in a, next month with their solution as to how they're doing. And I only hope that the government's response is generous and that they don't take uh, a mean, narrow view of what they might do. The, the, the Supreme Court did not say you cannot distinguish between asylum seekers and citizens. They didn't say that. They, they, they said, in some cases, you might be able to make a distinction, but not in this one. So it's up to the government now. And hopefully, the government will adopt the European position, which is the right to work after nine months, which is what we had recommended. You know. It would seem to be contradictory to their position and the generous position they have in granting new citizens. I'm coming to the end, but someone is citing poetry early on, and uh, someone asked me recently, was writing the report worthwhile because the government didn't embrace it? And remember, the government set it up, and the government had their people on it, so that every recommendation we made was passed by the civil servants who had got the clearance from the Secretary General of their departments. And yet, when it came to government, they dragged their feet on it. Am I the pessimistic? Should we never have done it? We should have done it. There are many reasons why I am proud that we did it and that the people involved did such a good work and, and recommended it. First of all, it was well received by the government, by the Oireachtas, by the Dáil and the Shannon. It was complimented, etc., etc. Secondly, it brought all the stakeholders, I hate that word stakeholders, but it's handy, uh, together. All the people who are interested in representing the NGOs, the government, and the interested individuals, and the asylum seekers themselves in direct provision. It brought them together, and they're speaking to each other. And that can't be bad. It should be emphasized that we were asked to look at the current system we were not asked to invent a new system. Our terms of reference confined us to the direct provision that was, as it was to make improvements in that. Fourthly, this, our working group report, sets out a program. And the government are following the program, patchy and all as their efforts are. But there's a program there. They can't say there's no program there. They can say we can't do that or we're trying our best. Or, but there's the program is set. And the, and the report keeps an agenda alive. And this is very important. That's why this lecture and this kind of uh, discussion is so important. These residents must not be forgotten. 
we cannot brush them aside. We have enough stains on our history in relation to residential institutions and other institutions recently to let this continue. There have been some positive gains too. The government did agree that the ombudsman could take complaints from the residents in the system, both the, uh, the, the ombudsman and the children's ombudsman. So if children have a complaint, they have a person to make it to now. And uh, the, there is some effort made to uh, improve the cooking conditions. Uh, the children's, and we recommended that the allowance, adults get 19 euro a week. Now, I ask you, 19 euro. And many of the centres are out in the country. So if you get a bus to the nearest place, there's not always transport. You have to pay the bus. You don't have free travel. You have to pay the bus. And if you go into town to walk around the shopping mall, enviously looking at things in windows, without any money in your pocket, 350 will take a cup of coffee. Where's 19? Children were given nine euros. How are you going to clothe and shoe children? Children is under 18. You know, a 14-year-old boy goes through shoes, you know, as anyone knows. And they're 100 euro a head, these sneakers. And they, these are not brands. These are just ordinary sneakers. Where are you going to get the money for it? And to the credit of the government, they have more recently introduced an integration policy. So they are addressing the, the, the issues of how people will integrate. We've seen it in Balladarine and all these people around, this is a special program, but how do people integrate? Well, we only have to look at France to learn the lesson of non-integration and how the Algerians were huddled away and herded away in corners. And what kind of a tinderbox do you have there now? So if there's the people are coming and if they are to integrate, they must integrate. I think I'll finish there, but since everyone is citing poetry, I might as well do it too. <laughs> I started with a statistic, a statistic but I'll finish with a poem. It's a poem by Langston Hughes, the American jazz poet. It's called I Too. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes. But I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. Thank you. Thank you.